you look around the room you'll see that the decorations look spectacular big thanks to our worship committee who decorated this room for our worship services for the advent season and to the scouts who brought all the decorations down from the other building and if you look around the grounds you'll see the day looks spectacular also again a big thanks to the scouts of troops 1717 and pack 579 for doing our fall cleanup yesterday here at the church thank you just a couple of other announcements about our advent services we'll be having two christmas eve worship services one at 4 30 p.m and one at 7 p.m and due to our limited seating because of the coronavirus you absolutely positively must sign up for the christmas eve services if you wish to attend in person you may begin signing up on Realm for Christmas Eve as early as December the 6th. And if you're not on Realm, please call the church office after December the 7th. Please read through the bulletin inserts that were emailed out to you in the church bulletin. There are many announcements there this week. The announcements include information regarding the poinsettia order form, the Micah donation list, and this year's angel tree giving. And now it is time for us to light the Advent candle. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time of waiting. We wait for God to send divine love and light into our dark world. How does this happen? God's light comes through Jesus, who became a human being just like you and me, so that he could show us the way back to God's divine love and light. And now a reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord said, I made a wonderful promise to Israel and Judah, and the days are coming when I will keep it. I promise that at the time will come when I will appoint a king from the family of David, a king who will be honest and rule with justice. In those days, Judah will be safe. Jerusalem will have peace and will be named the Lord gives justice. Today, we wait for the coming of Jesus. We begin in the dark on this first Sunday of Advent, and we light the first candle. Every week in Advent, we will light another candle. Each candle that we light will remind us that the light of the world will soon come to us in human form in that of baby Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. The kingdom of God is drawing near. May we prepare our hearts with God's peace, God's justice, and God's love. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 148, verses 10 to 14. Like your name, God, so your praise reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with justice. Mount Zion is glad. Judah's villages rejoice because of your judgments. Go around Zion. Encircle it. Count its towers. Note its ramparts. Tour its citadels. 
so that you can tell future generations. And now I'd like to invite you all to join me as we all say together, this God, our God, forever and ever, he will always lead us. Please pray along silently with me now as we pray our prayer of adoration. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. He experienced a humble birth, yet he came to rule over all. Helpless as a baby, he showed the power of your love. Poor in the things of this world, but he brought the wealth of your grace. Ignored by the powerful and important, yet he was worshipped and praised by shepherds, magi, and angels. Rejected by many, but he welcomes all of us who seek him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I would invite you to say with me, as we all say together, Lord, we adore you. And now over to Laura for our opening hymn. Good morning, everybody. Happy uh, first Sunday in Advent. Our opening hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And on the first Sunday of Advent, when we celebrate hope, I can't think of anything more appropriate. This song reminds us that so many people before us have struggled through difficult times and that God is with us. He is here. this morning is from Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 verse 1 in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near 
Please pray along silently with me now as I pray our prayer of confession. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ you came among us as a light shining in darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I would invite you to join me as we all say together, Lord, have mercy on us. Our assurance of pardon is from Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Our hymn is Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. children and youth. Our moment today comes from the Heritage Builders, Bible Stories for Preschoolers, Family Night Tool Chest, the Old Testament, Chapter 12, Jonah. Our theme for today is Jonah prayed to God and said, if you save me, I will obey. So Jonah lived at about the same time as Isaiah, who wrote the part of the Bible that we're going to be looking at today in our regular sermon. Remember Jonah? He was the guy that God told him to go to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. In fact, Jonah went the other way. And God sent a big fish to swallow Jonah and swim him to Nineveh. And that's why Jonah said, if you deliver me, I will obey. And you know, if you stop and think about it, sometimes we are like Jonah. Our teachers or our parents or even God in the Bible tells us to do something or not to do something and we don't listen and things don't really go the way we want them to then we have to go back to our parents or teachers or even to God and say you were right I should have listened to you but if you help me I'll listen to you next time and 
please help me. If we say that to God, God will definitely help us. And you know what? I'll bet your parents and teachers will too. So that's why Jonah prayed to God and said, if you save me, I'll obey. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to be reminded when we disobey you to say what Jonah said. If you save me, I'll obey. Because we know that you will save us and help us to do what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the point in our service where our kids normally collect our five cents a meal offering on the last Sunday of each month. But unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, we can't do that today. We support the Presbyterian Hunger Program, PCUSA, through a special five cents a meal offering on the last Sunday of each month. And this collection goes to alleviate hunger throughout the region served by the Presbytery of the James. Now, as I mentioned, we can't collect that offering because of the coronavirus, but we invite you to make a separate donation above your normal giving to the church by check or online, noting five cents a meal in the memo line. Would you please join me now in our prayer for illumination? Father God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our minds and hearts may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One scholar said that this section of Isaiah's prophecy is a question to the nation of Israel, God or Assyria? Or applied to our lives today, do we trust in the Lord or, we tr or do we trust in our world? In the end of chapter 7 and in chapter 8, God has just predicted the fall and the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. But there's still hope. And now at the beginning of chapter 9, Isaiah gives us a prophecy of hope in a messianic king. Now this is another passage that people often associate with Christmas. This passage relates to the human birth of Christ. And it also speaks to the establishment of his rule after his second advent. Because we see that God gives us a promise of hope through Isaiah of a king who will establish a kingdom of light that will drive out all forms of darkness. And so now, listen to the word of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he'll bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and a light has dawned on those living in darkness. You've enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at harvest time, and as they rejoiced when they divided the spoils. For you've shattered their oppressor's yoke, and the rod on their shoulders, and the staff of their oppressors, just as you did in the days of Midian. For every trampled boot of battle and bloody garment of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. As I mentioned to you before, when I was a college student, I spent a year studying at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. One weekend, the overseas study program, of which I was a part, made a trip to the fortress of Masada. Masada is the ancient fortress which was built as a summer palace for Herod the Great, who I like to call the Christmas Herod. 
Masada sits on a mountain overlooking the Dead Sea and the desert between the modern day countries of Israel and Jordan. Our bus left the university late on the first night because the plan was to climb the mountain of Masada and see the sunrise over the Dead Sea. We arrived at the base of the mountain at about three in the morning and our guides led us up to the gate of the trail and we sat down to wait until about four to start our climb. As we began to move toward the mountain, it got darker and darker in the canyon where the trail was located. It was incredibly dark on the trail, so dark that we needed to use flashlights to keep from falling. We reached the top and we sat down on the eastern edge of the fortress and waited for the sun to rise. And I gotta tell you, it was a beautiful sight. The eastern sky began to turn gray, and then it turned pink, and then an orangish red. And finally, the sun itself broke over the Jordanian hills on the other side of the Dead Sea. And as that occurred, the light began to drive the darkness away. Very soon after the sun was reflecting on the Dead Sea, hundreds of feet below, and it turned the water into a molten pool of brilliant light, red and orange and yellow. It was absolutely spectacular. As the light of the sun met the world of darkness that my friends and I had been climbing in, and the light shone upon us. In today's passage, Isaiah tells us about a person who will also drive the darkness away. He is the Messianic King. This would be a good time for you to turn your attention to your sermon notes. Maybe you printed those off from the email you received from the church on Thursday, or maybe you just want to pull them up on your favorite device. Either one is fine. It is the Messianic King who brings the light of freedom, which is followed by the light of peace, all of which is caused by the light of the sun, S-O-N. As today we're reminded that God gives us a prophecy of hope, of a king whose light will drive away all forms of darkness. So let's begin by looking at the light of freedom. In just a few short years after Isaiah's prophecy, the conquest of the Assyrians would bring gloom to the land. The oppression and slavery and what Isaiah calls anguish that the conquerors have caused will bring a state of gloom and doom to the northern kingdom of Israel. But it will also be a spiritual darkness. The Assyrians will worship other gods and force or cause the people of God to worship those gods too. It would be a situation that is just plain depressing. In scripture, there's this theme that all opposition to God is represented by darkness. The realm of Satan is represented as the kingdom of darkness. And part of the problem is that the people of God in the regions of Naphtali and Zebulon were living in a place where they were always having interaction with the pagan nations that surrounded them. This region is located just south of the modern day country of Lebanon and just west of the modern day country of Syria. It was inhabited by Canaanites, Phoenicians, and Hittites who brought the influences of their gods to this region. And that's why Israel calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. The people of Naphtali and Zebulon were often worshiping other gods. And that made the Holy One of Israel angry. And that's why he humbled them. These two regions were named after two of the tribes of ancient Israel, which in turn were named after two of the sons of Jacob, who was also called Israel. The spiritual darkness would continue through the time of the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and up to the time of the Romans, which was the time of the birth of Jesus. Not only would the Jewish people suffer the darkness of physical oppression of those outside nations, which would rule them, but they would also suffer the spiritual oppression of conquerors who would force them to worship other gods. They would literally be living in a darkness that would be so deep that its oppressiveness 
would touch every aspect of their lives until the dawning of the light. Isaiah says there'll be a time when they would see a great light, not just any light, but it would be a light that would break into the darkness and drive the darkness away. And the light would shine on the people. It wouldn't be hidden or limited. It would shine on all the people who had previously known only darkness. In John chapter 1, we see this prophecy fulfilled. When Jesus began his early earthly ministry, he caused the dawning of the kingdom of God. The truth of God and the kingdom of God burst into the world like the sun appearing over the mountains at dawn. The light of the freedom of Christ burst into the darkness of sin and oppression as he arrived to proclaim a freedom from sin, a freedom from eternal separation from God, and a freedom to walk in the light and serve God, to begin to become what we were created to be. God gives us a prophecy of hope in a messianic king whose light will drive out all forms of darkness. Well, this is followed by the light of peace. When the light shines in the darkness, it brings freedom, but it also brings peace, a harmonious and prosperous relationship between God and people and between individuals and each other. Isaiah says that God would increase the nation. In the religion of ancient Israel, having children was a blessing. Furthermore, a nation that had more people was a nation that was more powerful. And as a result of the light shining in the darkness, God will also bless the children of Israel, the people of God, with joy. Their gladness or their joy will increase as a result of the light dawning. They will be in the presence of God and their joy will be unspeakably immense. Isaiah compares that joy to the joy that the people feel at the time of the harvest. It's a time when, in this time and in this culture, most of the people were pretty much subsistence farmers. They couldn't just go to their local Walmart and stock up on groceries and drop by Vinnie's on their way home. When you live in a culture where starving to death was a real possibility, and missing a meal here or there was virtually guaranteed, the harvest was a time of joy. Another time of joy was when Isaiah compares it to the, compares the time of the Messiah to the time after the victory of a battle when the spoils are divided. You see, in this time and in this culture, war was an all-out affair. There was no Geneva Convention, there were no rules of engagement. The winners took the possessions of the losers, and the losers were enslaved, if not murdered. But for the winners, a victory in battle was an, an adrenaline-charged party. Now, Isaiah's not making a moral judgment on this practice. No, he's simply using it as an example that everybody in his time and culture would understand. And they would understand that intensity of the joy that will come at the time of the Messiah. This joy would also be expressed because the nation would have peace from their oppressors. The yoke would be broken. Now a yoke is a device that's used to attach an animal to a cart or a farm implement so that the oppression of being worked to death like an animal would be gone. The rod or stick which the Assyrians and the Babylonian oppressors would beat them with would also be broken as the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel were about to be the losers in the upcoming battles and the enslaved. But God would bring peace in the time of the Messiah, just like at the battle of Midian. Isaiah here is recalling a great battle between the humble farmer Gideon and God, who God used to defeat the oppressive Midianites in the time of the judges. And just as in the time of Gideon, so too God would fight for his people again. His victory would be so complete over the, Syria, over the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and eventually all forces of evil, that even the boots and the cloaks would be burned up, as well as the weapons of war. But God's victory will not be limited to his enemies in the time of Isaiah. 
Isaiah predicts that God's victory will extend to the end of time and will be an ultimate victory over all of his enemies. As today, God gives us a prophecy of a hope in a king whose light will drive away all forms of darkness. It will be the dawning of the light of the sun, S-O-N. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. I know, you all are probably hearing strains of Handel's Messiah playing in your head right now. But the promise of light is real, and they will be brought about by the Messiah who would be born. He's not only supernatural, but he's also a physical person who would be born and experience a human birth. He would be a son, the son of David and the son of God. Fully human and fully divine. Furthermore, he'll be given to us and for us. He will rule over us and over the world at that time with the gentleness of a little child. His rule will occur at a time in history when he returns once again, at the time when he has defeated all his enemies. It's a time predicted in the book of Daniel and in the Gospels and, of course, in the book of Revelation. And the government will be on his shoulders because he will be the king. Not just any king or president or prime minister or whatever, but the ultimate king, the perfect king. And he will rule with complete justice and success. And his name will be called the Wonderful Counselor. His rule will be wonderful because his counsel will be the wisdom and will of God. He will rule the nations with equity, equality, and justice. Not a justice that takes from one nation or group or individual and gives to another, no. But a justice that provides plenty to meet the needs of all. Furthermore, he will be a counselor who will also share his wisdom with individuals. And those who follow him will be blessed. Their lives will be characterized by harmony, not by strife or conflict, but by peace given by the light of the sun. Now, why is he going to be able to do all of this so successfully? Because he is the mighty God, a king who is born, yet a king who is God. The one who is so mighty and awesome that the entire universe is in his hands. He's also to be an eternal father. His time will never end. It will be eternal from the timeless past until the everlasting future. Now, in ancient times, the father was not only the head of the household, but he was also the ruler of the family, and all the other family members revered him. This Messiah will also be the Prince of Peace. He'll be a ruler who brings a reign of true peace. He'll bring the harmony between people and between people and God. It will be a peace based on harmony and goodwill. This king is the Messiah. And there'll be no end to the increase of his government. In other words, the blessings of his kingdom will be provided to his subjects, and they will continue to grow and multiply. Furthermore, this kingdom will fulfill the promise. The messianic king will be of the dynasty of the great King David. God doesn't forget or break his promises, no. Here, in the Messiah, he has not only kept, but he has fulfilled the promises to King David. And what's more, this is a just and righteous kingdom. Even the best of human governments at times treat their people unjustly. Somebody gets left out or by some mistake they're treated unjustly. But this kingdom will be totally righteous. What's more, this great kingdom will never end. It will go on forevermore. This king, this ruler, the Messiah, will have no end because he will be God himself. The Son of God, who we know 
as Jesus Christ. But ultimately, this king and his kingdom would not be established by any human nation or human force. No. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. I, I like this word zeal. We don't use it much anymore. But it's an, ex it's an expression of the intense, untamed, raw power of God. The God we worship who will accomplish all of this. I've known many people in my life who lived in a world of darkness. Emotional darkness or loneliness. The darkness of psychological dysfunction. The darkness of poverty. But far and away, many more people I've known who've lived in the darkness of sin. A spiritual darkness. All of them desperately seeking a light to break into their darkness and drive it away. I think that probably every generation that has ever lived has been looking for this wonderful counselor, this Prince of Peace in some form or another. And every time we think we've found a human leader to fit this bill, he or she disappoints us at best and becomes a dark counselor or a Prince of War at worst. Yet, we so long for this time to return once again. Even here in our world at Hartwood, which, I mean, if you think about it, we have things really pretty good here in Hartwood, but it's still not perfect. We long for that counselor who can tell us what to do in those subjective moments of life. We long for a Prince of Peace who will bring not only peace to our world, but peace to our lives. And we have him. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he is calling us to carry his light of freedom and peace. His light as the sun to a world that is lost in darkness. It is that hope in the light of his kingdom and his rule that, that his kingdom and his rule bring, which can change lives right here where we live. As today, we have seen that God gives us a promise of hope in a king whose light drives out all forms of darkness. Would you please join me in prayer? Father God, let the light of your son, Jesus Christ, Shine in our lives this Advent season. In his precious name, amen. Our hymn is, I Wonder as I Wander. So this is an old Appalachian carol. And for the longest time, it has this word that kind of, as I was listening to the pastor's sermon, I thought, gosh, I didn't know exactly what he was going to say, but this kind of fits. It's got a contraction in it um, that I always thought was a word. It talks about poor, ordinary people, but the contraction is ornery. And I've been accused of being ornery before, I don't know if you have. <laughs> don't talk to my mom, she might tell you the truth. Uh, but it talks about how Jesus came to offer us light and peace. And whether you consider yourself to be poor, or ordinary, or ornery, or all three, Jesus gives light to all of us. Thank you. 
And now it's time for our season of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you are the child that was born for us. You are God the Son that was given to us, and one day the government will be on your shoulders. You are named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace, and your dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. You will reign on the throne of King David and over the kingdom to establish and sustain it with true justice and ultimate righteousness from now on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. But now, Lord, some of us are living in the gloom of distress. Lord, some of us are walking in darkness. Father God, let your Holy Spirit touch our lives so that we may see the great light, the light that has dawned on those living in the land of darkness, the light of the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. Lord, we pray for all the members of our military who are serving at home and around the world, ensuring that we may come here this morning and worship you in safety and without fear. We pray that you protect them and give them strength and comfort them. We pray too for all of our first responders, all of our law enforcement officers and fire and rescue workers who day in and day out protect our communities. Please protect them and give them strength and wisdom to do their jobs well. Lord, we pray for our nation as we face the plague of the coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for all those who are suffering from the coronavirus, that you would comfort them and heal them. Be with their families and protect and comfort them. We pray for those who have not been infected with that virus and that you would protect them from becoming infected with the coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for all of our healthcare workers as they treat those who are suffering from the virus, that they would have wisdom, compassion, and energy to care for those who are suffering. And please protect them and their families from being infected with this disease. Please bless us soon, Lord, with a vaccine and an effective treatment. Lord, as our thoughts turn closer to home, we pray for all of those in our community who are on our prayer list, the family of Carl Gould, for Andy, and for Diane, for Elaine, we pray for Kathleen and for Guy. We pray for Marilyn and Michelle. We pray for Rick and for Sue. Lord, we lift them up to your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I would like to invite you to take a moment and lift up your silent prayers to the Lord. pray along silently with me now as I pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, please join me as we all say together, Lord, hear our prayer. Please follow along with me now as I state our affirmation of faith. Our affirmation of faith this morning is from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead, to believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite you to join me as we all say together, Lord, we affirm our faith in you. Please join me now and then pray along silently with me as I pray our prayer of dedication. We bring offerings of love, O God, with a prayer that through these gifts, your will might be done. We're ever conscious that our gifts must be accompanied by our desire to serve your holy will. Bless us in all that we would do and all that we are. Amen. And please join me as we all say together, Lord, we dedicate our gifts to your kingdom. Our closing hymn is What Child Is This? Thank you.